So we have dubbed this project as CFI, and you'll get your fair dose of the acronym today. Uh, this is synthesizing call frame information. And um, um, basically what I want to go over today is some aspects of the implementation, not detail, but um, the, the, the basic um, idea here is that GAS has some, the implementation that we have carried out in GAS, it has some um, permissibility criteria. So not all input assembly is acceptable to GAS if you, want to gen if you want to synthesize call frame information. So I want to talk about some of those aspects and I would like to get some feedback here because kernel is a use case. And so which of the, as I talk through those, um, I would like some feedback on which of those constraints are very limiting and so on for the kernel and what can be done to make this offering more useful in general for the kernel and other uh, user space as well. So this is what we are doing in this project, right? So we we write inline assembly and we, we combine it with the associated um, CFI directives, which indicate how is it that the that the stack trace or the stack unwind information for this assembly is, right? So we are, we are in a place where we write both inline assembly and CFI directives, and we want to move to a space where you for much, for, well, so we want to move to a space where for many use cases, you can just write the input assembly and GAS carries out what is needed to, to generate these CFIs um, automatically. And the reason we want to do that is the obvious one that, you know, writing CFI directives needs a notch more expertise. And sometimes it so happens that even if you, when you do write CFI directives, they are there is a bug in it, or sometimes they are you know not included in the assembly. Either of these will affect will affect the end result, as in there may be bad outcomes at a bad time. You may get a bad stack trace, or if you were unwinding using this information, there could be um, some state corruption, right? So. Um, So this is the mission statement. We do want to target both uh, handwritten assembly and inline assembly. And so what we want to do is synthesize call frame information. And there is fine print, right? So when you say call frame information, you you basically want to um, do some stack. You, you want to generate some stack unwind information. So what you're saying is we want to synthesize these CFIs. And then this, um, this basically, uh, means that you want to generate all the information that is necessary to recover your CFA, you know, the canonical frame address and call save registers. So there is an implicit um, um, assumption here that when you are using a CFI, your code is ABI conformant, right? There, there's some calling standards that you're following and which is what the implementation in GAS also relies. So you can use a CFI for ABI conformant code, but not for the non-ABI conformant um, code base. So let's get the first big elephant out. Can you generate all CFI directives? Short answer is no. There's going to be some of these CFI directives which the gas cannot synthesize, right? So CFI signal frame, these are these are the examples. Right? Well, this is the set, sorry, not example. This is a set and um, you do need the user to indicate whether a particular piece of inline assembly is actually a signal frame. CFI sections is another directive that a user will have to say whether uh, the stack unwind information or the stack trace information needs to be generated in a specific section. CFI label is another one. So for these, at least the user is the only entity that can provide it. GAS cannot synthesize it. Now, even if these were left out, can you synthesize CFI for all input assembly? And as we will see, the short answer is no. There are some constraints that have to be satisfied. But it is doable, and that's what I want to gauge how useful is uh, this for the kernel. So at this time, this is work in progress. Well, we have patches. We have tested it on x86. Um, limited set of input, yes. Um, currently, this is um, what, what, what's, what works currently is basically x86, and there is this new command line option, SCFI all. Um, Adding support for SCFI inline is on the roadmap, and also adding support for AR64 is on the roadmap. Um, so currently, SCFI all for x86, what it will do is it will try to synthesize CFI directives. 
Um, if the user assembly does contain some CFI directives, like if you have input assembly, which already had um, CFI, start proc, define CFA, whatnot, those will be ignored by GAS. It will try to synthesize CFI for you, but this set will not be ignored. GAS will try to entertain them. So yes, this is the bulk of what I wanted to talk about. So basically, as I was hinting, there is some permissibility criteria here. GAS cannot synthesize for all input assembly. And I want to go over some of those things that I call as constraints and uh, get a, you know get some impression of how limiting this is for the kernel and maybe other code bases. This is a brief trailer. There is fine print, but I want to go over it just to give you an idea of what's coming next. Um, SCFI is only for ABI conformant code. And since you are you are dealing with SCFI, as in you're you're wanting to generate C, C you're wanting to synthesize CFI, there is an implicit assumption that you are interested in asynchronous stack unwinding. You are aware that you will write the code such that at each PC you are interested in uh, you know um, stack walking and stack unwinding. There are so we'll get to the fine print, but um, and the third one is um, the CFA. It's, uh, the CFA must be registered SP or FP based, as in um, um, the. Well, maybe let's talk about this in the next few slides. Um, CFA based register, either if it is SP or FP based, it has to be traceable at all times. Let's talk about it next. And um, the last one is that if your code does have indirect branches or jump tables, something that gas something that does not allow gas to create a control flow graph, gas will bail out, giving you a warning, you know, that this control flow is not something I understand. I'm not going to give you any SCFI for it. And we'll see why. So now I'm going to talk about those, um, you know, the constraints, so to speak. So first thing that the gas has to do is um, figure out what is the start of a particular, you know, uh, function for which you desire a, a CFI. So the first requirement that it says is, can you mark? Can you mark the input assembly for me? So what you have to do is say a dot type and name of the uh, function and so on. So if you were writing a single ASM file, um, it does not mandate you. It does so ending it with a size is recommended in that cases. But if you were multiplexing different sections, so for example, you started writing a text section and then you decided to write some cold part of your function in another section, you should end. This will be mandatory on gas. The implementation will be such that you have to indicate to gas where is it that this function has ended using a side directive. But for, if it's for a single function, um, closing with dot size will be recommended. Um, for inline assembly, let's skip for now. Uh, let's focus, I think, for today just on the um, input, um, sorry, um, yeah, the daughter's files. Um, the second thing that GAS um, will enforce for SCFI is that uh, control flow, right? So internally in GAS, um, it tries to, it tries to, you know, interpret instructions and then carry forward the CFI from a basic block to the next. Now, if it see, and, and as it does it, it tries to validate that if there are two different control flows. So for example, for the basic block D, there are two different control flows reaching it. It tries to validate that is this is is the CFI state reaching D from A, B, D is the same as A, C, D. So it tries to validate at each incoming edge of a basic block. Does it make sense? Is the state consistent across what I've seen so far? So which is why it needs to generate that CFG. And if in the beginning of this pass, it says that there are these um, indirect branches or so on, and I cannot create a CFG, I'm going to bail out. So gas gives you a warning at this time. It says untraceable control flow, skipping SCFI, right? So this is a second requirement. You, If you have functions which have indirect branches and so on, SCFI is not useful for it. Um, now we are switching gears and we talk about, you know, um, more on the lines of, how is it that the input assembly should look like? Now, as I was hinting earlier, there is a notion that SCFI is for ABI or ABI conformant code. So you should have followed the call calling conventions. 
So internally in gas, what this means is that gas is going to. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that we ignore the syscall entry point in the term, right? Because all you just facing is the API conformity and following a PCS. But as soon as you get to the syscall point, you don't follow the API or PCS at all. Yeah. So we, have, we have to get five or six registers or five or six arguments in the register, the kernel, and then things start following PCS again. So do we just skip? Are we saying at this point? I'm just trying to make sure that for the input asking convention, we're just are we just skipping the entry points? To, I mean, Go has handwritten assembly and the kernel, so that you'll see jokes of the console, and so there's a bunch of stuff. So do we skip that, that part? part? Yes. OK, perfect. Yes. Because the stat pointer is going to be consistent. Well, yeah, but well. the problem will be that the syscall, everything in the syscall will be different. The the registers and everything else will be totally clobbered. We move things around, we reorganize stuff, and then we call into the kernel. And there's also um, lightweight syscalls that follow alternative PCS into the kernel as well. For And that's for, I think, 32-bit ARM and 32-bit PA. So what cannot be done is gas cannot warn you. So I just want to say one thing. Um, so far, you've described this as a per file attribute. We have mixtures of functions in the same file where some of them are ABI, ABI conformant, procedure call standard compliant, and others are not. So this would probably need to be a per, per function attribute that whether or not we do this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so what I was saying, um, what I was saying earlier was that, um, yes, uh, SEFI cannot be used for it, but the challenge here is also uh, ideally, it would be good if we could warn the user somehow, but that's just not possible because of the nature of things as in, um, yeah, yeah. It, so gas will try to, gas has a, no, the reason why, how all of this is weaved in is basically gas has, an, has, a, has the idea about what this ABI is and hence what the Kali save registers are. So it tries to figure out these are being stashed to stack and so on. But if you don't, it won't warn you uh, before you do that, before you smash it away. Uh, without saving. So, yes, so continuing on the ABI and calling convention side, uh, gas at this, yeah, gas will try to, gas has a notion of what are the calling save registers. So it'll try to figure out um, first um, where are the saves and where are the restores. And if there, if so, and it does try to protect you to some extent uh, on asymmetric saves and restores. So if you saved the Kali saved registers and restoring in maybe in a um, different order and so on, it'll try to cross check what is the offset that you were saving that that you had saved this to, and is the offset at restore the same? And it'll try to warn you if this is asymmetrical. The third one um, is. Uh, balance stack at return. This hasn't been implemented, but it could be done in gas, as in it could warn you if um, at return the stack pointer is not the same as expected. So how is this a restriction? Well, uh, it's it's a restriction in the sense that if you write unsafe assembly, it'll SCFI will SCFI will try to warn you in many of those cases, but there is no guarantee, I think, for at least the symmetric saves and restores that you will get a warning in all cases because it is a little bit um, complicated for gas to figure out um, sometimes that this restore is at the save ad same address as save. Um, the last set of uh, restrictions that are basically coming in are because of um, asynchronous stack unwinding. So because you're using SCFI, the assumption here is you are interested in asynchronous stack unwinding and you must have written the code accordingly. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so dwarf standard at least says that CFA, your canonical frame address can be one of these two types. You have a register and from that register at a specific offset, you know where the CFA is or dwarf may also allow you to recover CFA using some dwarf expression. Now in gas, there is no way you can synthesize a dwarf expression. So the assumption here is that you must have some code where this is easily, you know, uh, gas can easily figure it out, right? So um, what this means is that, so in 
in your functions, you're most likely doing one of the two, of course, static stack allocation or dynamic. So for static stack allocation, this is not a problem because you were anyway using register SP and you were anyway not doing it in an untraceable way. Untraceable just means that you got, a, you got your stack pointer and you're not doing something like adding a register to it and you don't know at a particular point in your program how is where is the stack pointer, right? So in static stack allocation, you will most likely have it traceable. This is not an issue. And for dynamic stack allocation, though, what we would like the user to do is switch to FP. Most users typically do do that, except, you know, well, you may use some register to, um, you know, to stash your stack pointer in. What GAS and SCFI implementation is asking is that you use frame pointer and nothing else. So switching to any other quality save register is not supported. And this is mainly because if GAS, the implementation becomes bulkier, it's much more simpler to just constrain it saying that, can you please use our register F? for you know saving away your stack pointer if you're doing dynamic stack allocation so typically what you would do is yeah you'll save away your stack pointer and then do your stack dynamic stack allocation restore and uh, this is a typical template that gas would expect but if it sees that sp is being sashed away to some other register it'll complain that this is not supported um, so which also consequently means that dwrap is not supported now dwrap is um is the dynamic realigned argument pointer. GCC tends to generate it in some specific cases. I still have to you know, get my grip on it in what cases is DRAP um, really coming out. But it is not supported currently. It is a very specific pattern, though. If you are using DRAP patterns in your handwritten assembly, we could somehow accommodate it because it's a specific pattern. But I think first thing that I want to do here is at least first go and um, get a full grip on it. So essentially what all of this is coming out to is that your CFA has to be registered SP or FP based. Nothing else is supported. Okay, so at this time, I think I've covered most of these, um, what I called as eligibility criteria. And um, this does, lim so, no so we started out with this mission statement that we want to synthesize CFI for input assembly, but we do see that gas cannot do it for all input assembly. There are these set of permissibility criteria. Um, how useful is it for the kernel? I haven't had um, the time yet to go and look at uh, or try it on the kernel um, input assembly, but I would like to get it at some point. Um, so, and what else can we do uh, to make it more useful for the kernel? Um, I know there are some sequence, uh, some patterns that were brought to notice, but I haven't looked at it. Basically, if the kernel is doing things like alternatives, um, how does this fit in? I still have to close up on those things, but any um, inputs or questions? So in addition to alternatives where you can patch in branches and so on, we also have uh, exceptional control flow through the X table mechanism. So things like U access, where what looks like a load or a store instruction will actually effectively be a branch to an exception handler elsewhere in the assembly. And gas will have absolutely no visibility of that. In those cases, we do go and create um, an entry in a different section as well. So push section, do a drop some entries in there, pop section and so on. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of practical cases like that. That will be a lot of inline assembly does that sort of thing, because that's why we're using inline assembly in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got many cases where we do weird control flow all over the place. Um, and as I mentioned, mixtures of um, functions which are PCS compliant and other functions which are not PCS compliant. I really think if this is going to be a thing, it needs to be a per function opt-in explicitly rather than a global thing on the file. Um, because then we can at least say, I know that this is a simple control flow function, just do it for me. And then we're not surprised by it missing something else. Right. Um, and sorry for one last thing, and I'll hand over to you. And I think on ARM64 in general, our opinion has been we don't want to reverse control flow at all if avoidable. So we really only want this for simple functions. That's would be like library functions like memcopy and that sort of thing. And I think for everything else, we would be largely happy to write explicit annotations. And I think that would be our preference because we just don't want to be surprised by the tool doing something automatically behind our back that we're not expecting. 
All right, so on x86, um, our goal, because of live patching and the Orkin winder, we have OBJ tool, which is already doing a lot of this uh, control flow graph of uh, reverse engineering. So we, we don't have any gaps or in the entire kernel as far as um, unwinding metadata. So um, at least that's, you know, that's our, our current status is there's no gaps. And the way we did that was um, we have these unwind hints. So if, if it's, if like we already have what's similar to what you have, where if you um, analyze a function and it, it follows ABI, that's pretty straightforward. But then all the other, there's quite a bit of assembly code in the kernel that doesn't follow ABI. So in order to handle that, we have these unwind hints, which are analogous to CFI commands. And um, so we just follow those. We still understand those and, and follow those and, and follow the control flow graph from the hints as well. Um, so doing that, we have, a, we have like full coverage of all the assembly. So if the goal were to have full coverage even outside of um, function of ABI, you know, functions, um, it's possible. You would, you would just have to read, you'd, instead of ignoring the CFI hints, you'd have to read those and incorporate those into your control flow graph. Also for, you know, one thing that I've been wondering is that all of this is, is more than what the kernel and OBJ tool generally provides, right? It's just stack walking. This goes to the extent of stack unwinding. So there are more guarantees in place that it asks. So if we, if, if it's just stack walking, then it's just the SP and FP that you put your rules on. Uh, so ABI conformance has, in this case, ABI conformance is, uh, you know, like a spectrum of different decision points for just stack walking. It's a lesser restriction than stack unwind. SCFI currently is in the stack unwind um, category, but if we, relax it somehow to just generate, say, stack walking information. Because what this is generating is all the complete dwarf CFI. The complete dwarf CFI is for stack unwind. A subset of dwarf CFI is what you need for stack tracing. Currently, you don't have that flexibility in gas either. A CFI is just stack unwind complete. I did wonder if that's that could maybe solve some of these, uh, you know, non-ABI conform. You could accept some of those non-ABI um, conformant code be code as well. Covers additional registers, not just the stack pointer and frame pointer. Yes. Okay. So from just, from a consumer I'm, point of view, I would love for uh, I would love for something like this to just get rid of alternate formats like ORC. <laughs> but uh, that's um, so for that like. I guess, again, from like the consumer point of view, it'd be great to have full coverage and have falling back to a stack walking only mode for functions where you can't figure out the uh, the rest of the registers is still way better than just not having anything. When it comes to the... Um... I mean, we thought that doing this, you know, like to reverse engineer the call frame information and also the control flow graph at the assembly time. Um, basically, some advantage that they may have, you know, compared to actually doing the same thing from the object files is that when you work with the object files, you have to actually handle everything, right? Including compiler generated code. And that can get uh, tricky. And uh, so basically with this approach, you can still use the call frame info generated by the, the C compiler for the compiled parts. And then you can get the assembler to reverse engineer the rest of it for you, right? Like they are with an assembly or inline assembly. And for that, of course, you have to keep the CFI uh, information generated from GCC and incorporate it into yours. Yeah, so one, one thing I'd, I'd urge some caution on that is that, for example, in ARM64, we've gained new branch instructions and new control flow instructions in the last year. So 
if we're relying on the assembler to understand those instructions in order to um, actually re regenerate this control flow, we can't add those new instructions in the kernel until we upgrade to a to an assembler that knows that. And today, that's not what we do. We go and hand assemble the opcodes for new instructions so that we can work with old assemblers. So, sorry. <clears throat> So relying on the assembler to understand the semantics of the bit encodings is not going to be workable unless we provide additional restrictions that you have to upgrade your tool chain. If it incorporated the CFI and as far, part of the assembler's control flow graph, um, then you could insert the CFI along with your manual instruction. Yeah, so I think from my perspective, the best thing here is going to be a, a mixture of this and manual assembly, which is why I said earlier that I think we really want explicit opt-in for this for the simple cases. Because then, because then, yeah, I'm perfectly happy to use this for things like mem copy and whatever if that if that works and we can rely on a tool chain that is up to date and understands the basic control flow we do there. But I don't really want to rely on it going forward for absolutely everything because I know that we are going to have new instructions that the assembler doesn't understand. I know that we're going to do weird new control flow that we don't do today because we have plans to do certain things and there are things on the cards where we will just come up with new things that this doesn't understand. I don't want to be hamstrung by that. And I think further, one of the reasons from R64 we said we didn't want to like reverse engineer control flow with obj tool for the kernel was that the agent generating the thing, the agent, the agent generating the code, the agent actually generating control flow information were different. I would be more happy with using obj tool to reverse engineer handwritten assembly control flow because we're then we're in control of both parts. We can upgrade obj tool to understand to match our expectations as kernel developers. It's very difficult for us to go and update um, the assembler to match our expectations because there's a there's just an impedance mismatch. They're different. They're being different projects. And what if you could uh, configure the assembler? Because this, the, the generic instructions that this is actually implementing is not that many of them. And uh, what if, I mean, if you could actually tell the assembler, so this binary pattern is this new instruction, like, and uh, translate it into this How generic is any instruction. Than just manually adding the annotations As or a using Oxford to do that. Sort of I, a configuration file, yeah. I, I, that seems very fragile to me. Um, what sorry, I can, what's the sorry but um, i think there's a lot of detail that we can't really cover right now on what was that configuration file look like how is it interpreting the bit oh well yeah, yeah but how right. is it fragile that's what they don't get sorry for the, the approach how is the approach fragile i mean in the sense that you say okay this particular instruction is actually saving the value of this register into this so you know like okay and if i've got a branch instruction with 26 bit immediate which has a weird scaling factor for that immediate where like small values are uh, linear and larger values even have jumps and that sort of thing. Okay, so it's the jump? complexity of the encoding, yeah. right? Uh, okay. So, so, so there's yeah. that and the, the semantic could be complex and I don't know how you would express that in a simple way, which is why I prefer to generate that myself, whether that's manually adding annotations or having something like Obj tool that, that I'm in control of as a kernel developer to do that. So I think having that in the same place is the important part. And it's not that the technology here is wrong, it's structurally difficult because one part's in the assembler and one part's in the kernel side, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it has to be, the support has to be in the tool chain for it to be uptaken, that's true. That comes with the offering, yeah. as well that's uh, in extension uh, coming along hopefully sooner rather than later um, one thing you said earlier about the uh, the case where turning this on would ignore existing um, annotations uh, why is that because sure in the case that you have existing annotations and there is a mismatch surely you can warn about it but in the case that there are in the case that some bits are handwritten, generally that would be preferable to ignoring it and figuring it out yourself. You could go that way too. The reason it's ignored is because, I mean, so in a way, when you call the assembler with SCFI, you do intend 
The intention for that argument is to synthesize. We, you could provide another argument where you say, I have it, don't ignore it, try to validate it. But we just didn't consider it as the first option to go to. Uh, but if that's useful, it could be considered. But the catch here will remain that it, this should not be used for compiler-generated code. It should be used for you know handwritten assembly. And the reason being that compiler-generated code looks, well, first, you don't need that. And second, it does. It, there is more complexity for sure. Um, there, it, there, there are definitely cases where it's going to need manual annotations. Um, and if this is going to be useful, the manual annotations need to be honored as, as given. Um, you, you look at uh, you look at things like the speculative mitigations we've got, and we have some horrendous nonsense in there in terms of control flow and instruction encodings. And there, there, there's no hope that, a, uh, that an automatic tool can understand that. Whereas in that case where we provide manual annotations because, well, we know better than the, than the CPUs in some cases, um, that will need, if you want this to work, there are cases where you will need to accept manual annotations um, and you need to have a way of making that easy to do. But the manual annotations are for what exactly in this case? They are saying, they, they are indicating um, CFI for, for, for what are these manual annotations? Well, uh, I don't think we have any at the moment because it's all object tool, but. Oh, there's unwind hints. Unwind hints, which are annotations, they're comparable, analogous to CFI annotations. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we have those quite a bit, but that's, that's because we have a goal of full coverage and you're not necessarily going for that. Yes. Here. And that must be those un unwind hints must be for the cases where it's not ABI conformant or so to speak, right? Something that um, so those cases where, for example, the stack pointer is the CFA is um, CFA's base register is something else. So the, those specific cases, right? But for the standard ABI conf conformant cases, you do not need any unwind hints, correct? Yes. Right, right. Um, so uh, let's take, for example, like a very basic case of like 32 bit mem copy on x86 out of line assembler. Do we know, does that have manually annotated like CFI directives in that assembler? Does it have on? So the answer is no for the recording. Uh, like people externally, sorry to get another mic, but uh, do we have unwind hints in those? No. Okay, no as well for that. So it sounds like. Maybe for like a simple case like that, that's maybe a good start for something like this is if it's just an assembler flag, you can say like, we don't trust the person writing the assembly to get it even right here. Maybe we could auto-generate it. Yeah, sorry, that was what I was trying to say earlier about having explicit opt-in per function. Because if I, because we like in the kernel, we got the sim func start, sim func end. If I have a thing where I can say, this is a simple function. I know I'm not doing anything special with control flow and following certain rules. Well, I'll give it to you in a second. <laughs> uh, for those cases, yeah, sure, we, that would be fine, as long as we don't have the other issues I mentioned earlier about adding new instructions and whatever. For more complex cases, we do we definitely do weird things, even in things that we annotate with simfunk start, simfunk end, because there's like a bit in the middle where we have unusual control flow. And I really don't want a tool that automatically does this thing for an entire file without an explicit opt-in per function, because otherwise I just cannot turn it on. So um, on x86, we have a requirement that if you have simfunk start simfunk end, which gives the elf file and or function annotation to the function, then you have to be standard. Basically, you don't do anything funny. That's it just it's just kind of the of the standard that we have. Yeah, sorry, and, and I think on ARM sixty four at the moment because we don't have absolutely everything. Our, our only requirement for simfunk start simfunk end is that you're using the link register at the function call boundaries, and you're using a frame pointer at uh, when you're called into something else. So. But in the middle of those two sections, we have no real structural requirement that you're not doing anything weird. And so if you've got things like X table entries, that's fine to use in a sim funk start, sim funk end thing. And that would confuse a tool like this because registers are suddenly changed behind your back by something that happened behind the scenes in an exception handler. Right. And so there's there's a, a very there's a range of possibilities yeah, for a different 
Well, it, it would affect the unwind case, though, because registers have suddenly changed, and so things have moved between registers without the assembler's knowledge, right? Sorry, let me grab another mic for you guys. <laughs> I, think yeah. there's, is there another one over here I think this was the one from over here, so I think just a... I guess there's only one. Sorry. No, just got that. Oh, there it is. So, hello. So for the exception case, are you you're talking about the changed registers? Is that inside the exception or after you return? Yes. So in the exception case for like you access, we yeah. try and do a load of user space address. Yeah. And then we take um because it faults, we take an exception. And in the exception handler, we will mess around with a bunch of registers. We'll change a value in one. We can shuffle things around. So if you're using this for unwinding and trying to say Here's where this value was. That has changed behind your back. No, and there is no visibility of that in the source code at all. If you're using it, sorry, unwinding in the sense it was mentioned earlier of getting all of the information out. Right, but the stack size is still the same in the function that. Yeah. So for, for, for just getting caller information and doing a, a stack trace out, yeah, it, it will be fine. Mm -hmm. But if we were trying to use this for unwinding as, sorry, for the more complex unwinding cases, that would be insufficient. And there are other cases where we do other unusual things today where things will change. Um, yeah. But I think the key thing is, at the moment, we have an idea of this is procedure call standard compliant. Actually, there are a variety of procedure call standards that we might be in use in different places where we want to annotate them differently. And effectively, on x86, with the different return type um, mitigation, return mitigations, you are effectively got a runtime choice between a few different procedure call standards that get patched in and boot. Yeah. So, right. Um, Sure. So back to the new instructions. So I guess that uh, if you add new instructions in ARM64 and you don't want to to bump the requirement on the assembler, I guess that you are encoding your instructions using data directives, right? Somehow in the handwritten assembly. Yeah, I'm using inst directives, and it's a standard thing that we we've done that. Yeah, in the past yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, do you have the uh, any slides or something where you can see the the G instructions intermixed with the with the normal x86 assembly? Well, um, so basically, what this the assembler is doing for this is that in the particular target in gas in the assembler, um, certain instructions get translated into some sort of generic internal instruction, which are super simple. Right, uh, we call them genes for gas instructions, and if we added support, so you could actually you could say the dot inst you encode your fancy new ARM sixty four instruction, and then if we, we could we will add a directive, so you could actually write the equivalent G generic instructions for that. You will not have to to yeah. deal with the encoding at all. Yeah, so I, I think maybe going forwards, but practically we have to support existing tool chains which don't have this. We have to have one solution for those, which is to handle simple things using inst. So I would much rather mm. explicitly have annotations that I have to add for whether they're CFI directors, whether they're unwind hints that we munge into something else, whatever. I'd rather do that because then it works with the current tool chains and works going forwards. I'm happy to do things that work better going forwards, but I don't want to rely solely on new tool chain functionality where we might get caught out by the semantic is not currently expressible in that generic thing and that needs to evolve in future in order for us to be able to express it and that's sort of yeah yeah okay uh so i uh, i was kind of curious about so mark had this you know request about um functionality like being able to turn this on or off per function basis do you have any assembler directives in here to be able to say like i want this function to have inferred cfi versus i don't want this function to have inferred cfi because that might that may be useful maybe yeah. to opt in or out more flexibly, um, and I think like having a compiler have function attributes is nice because you can then opt out or opt in, um, and then the compiler command line flags essentially just add this function attribute to every function or not makes it easy. Um, one thing that might be helpful too for kernel developers trying to write assembly and getting their CFI directives wrong is like it sounds like this tooling is in the assembler. <coughs> excuse me to um when it's generating the object file to generate the correct like see if like data representation for the cfi um it might be nice to be able to feed the assembler like a .s file and say like can you tell me how i should write my cfi files and then i can manually go and put those back in in sources like if this is trying to reconstruct control flow of the assembler 
and generate the CFI directives, like can it just spit them out to std error and say like, maybe you want to put these in manually and then we can worry about putting them in in the right place or not when we have support. I mean, in a way the flow exists, but there is a little bit of work needed there in the sense that once you have generated the CFI, you can emit them in the EH frame section, read it up and then reverse engineer from there what CFI is needed. But uh, verbatim, no, they are not dumped out right now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, kind of bubbling up the conversation a bit uh, once more, it seems from the assembler's perspective, it's probably a more useful thing to uh, have this as an assembler validation feature, mm. which then auto generates CFI for functions that don't have CFI. Mm. Uh, so that way you, you can use whatever CFI is available and you know, not tinker with it, but at the same time validate it and probably throw out warnings wherever you know you find bugs oh, yeah. uh, and then uh, in functions that don't have cfi you just like put it in there yeah and that that also would probably be a more kind of more easily acceptable solution for all existing like assembly implementations and i'm i'm looking not just at the kernel but at glpc as well for that for that purpose i think uh will be just making that point on chat right now for our audience here, I see Will making that point that it might be nice for guests to validate handwritten CFI directives. It would be like the beginning of assembly validation. Thematic validation. Mm -hmm. So one use case that I have in mind, maybe it doesn't apply well to kernel, but for user space, is JDID code. If you want to emit CFI directive for code that's been generated at runtime. Now, it seems to me that this tool is integrated in Binutil in gas for static generations. What about dynamic generation of CFI directive? Um, not sure I understand it perfectly. Um, for jittered code, so why is the problem? You want to unwind out of the jittered code. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right, but why is the problem any different? Like it is still, it is still the same problem that given some some input assembly, you want to synthesize. Yeah, CFI it's just that the tool right now is static, right? It's part of tool chain and right, right, right. it's not part of dynamic yeah. or the runtime. So yeah, yeah. having something in the runtime that I can include and say, okay, this this byte code now it's been generated to na native assembly. Mm -hmm. I want you to generate the directive for me so I can have the S frame to do the unwinding. Well, for yeah, to call to call that, but it's the responsibility to to put that out of Binutil and put it as a uh, library to be used. So this is... Is yeah. Yeah, but we don't have an assembler in a library in Binutil. Okay. Yeah. It's a okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's very tied to to gas and Binutil's workings. It. It's not something easily exportable at this time. Uh, we got five more minutes for questions. Just to check. Um, based on some of Mark's comments, I wonder if this would be more useful for the kernel perspective with inline assembly, um, because the ARM64 people are very much against um, OBJ tool reverse engineering the control flow graph of GCC you know, compiled file files, um, whereas you seem more uh, amenable to have an OBJ tool with assembly files, right? Yes, yeah, so I think, just to be clear, personally, okay. my opinion, um, is perhaps different from Wills and Kettle and the ARM64 maintainers. I just want to call that out ahead of time so I don't say anything that they disagree with. But yeah, in general, we we don't want, we didn't want Obstool to reverse engineer a compiler generated control flow because they are distinct agents and they evolve differently and things change over time and that sort of thing. So for the same reason, I'm not keen on reverse engineering handwritten assembly in the assembler because they're two different things from actually different time. But I'm more happy with having something like Obstool in the kernel tree, which is owned by the same people writing the inline assembly doing that sort of reverse engineering. Um, I also think that for most inline assembly, the control flow is 
going to sorry the control flow is going to fall into two buckets either it's going to be really simple we're trying to target like one two three instruction sequence that's not doing anything with control flow at all it's just straight line which is fine so I'm not sure it's the vast becoming case, but it, <laughs> but sorry, it's what I'm going to get to is that there are two big cases. That's one of them. And probably in terms of like number of instances in the source code, that's the common case. But in terms of number that get generated, I think X table style, we take an exception and do some things and come back and go to a different place. So there's just some implicit control flow that's missing. I suspect that's actually more common by terms of instances in the binary because like get user is everywhere. Um, and for those cases, I think we're going to have to have an annotate. We're going to have to have manual annotations anyway. So I'm not sure where the boundary falls on. But even then, you could put CFI in the. Even then, you could put CFI in the inline ASM. To. So I think just having an ability, whether it's a macro that we have, like in the kernel source tree, or or it's a tool, or whatever, where we just say this is a simple case. Just just make it straight line for me. That would be nice. I don't know if that requires a external tooling at the kernel source tree or additional tooling. If that's something we can just do with existing directives. Um, and that, I think, would cover the common case, which I think we're both agreeing on. So for the in <coughs> inline assembly case as well, um, is there a need to provide something like an opt-in or opt-in, opt-out? Are there cases where inline assembly may be doing fancier yes. things? Yes. yes, there is a mixture. Very so nice then assembly. this has to be an additional CFI directive. Yeah, so, sorry. So I'm, I'm saying, I, I think the right. key thing I'm saying is we want something explicit, right. Right. whether it's saying this is simple, just mm -hmm. figure it out, or I'm doing something unusual, I have to go and write every single thing. Mm -hmm. But it it would it's a nice to have that for the simple case, we could just have a single thing that says, this is simple, straight line, just do the right thing. And I don't have to add an annotation between every instruction, for example. Mm -hmm. It's worth saying that um, in things like alternatives, we do have cases where um, where one side of an alternative is straight line and the other side of the alternative is a call. Um, that causes a huge number of problems. Yeah. So and, and static calls or sorry, static calls, static branches, obviously yeah. a similar thing. Arm sixty four has alternative branches, which are like static branches but done through alternatives for reasons. Um, we don't have function calls today in alternatives, but we are likely to have something like that in future. Um, so we, we definitely have cases where like the, the assembly you see in place is going to get patched with something that looks completely different, have different control flow and different manipulation of registers. Hmm. But a call instruction doesn't affect the callee's stack. On ARM64, it will clobber the link register. <laughs> so, so if you're using the frame point to do the on one, that's fine. But you, so, so you, I believe, effectively, you'll have to say that the link register is clobbered. But if your unwinder believes that the frame pointer information and the link register information are equivalent, that would be wrong. So, it, it may work out, but there are additional things to consider. Right. Thank you. We have a Thanks. break now. Ten minutes. Thank <laughs> you.